How's everybody doing? Okay. So please download your notes and your exercise for today. We'll start in a minute, okay? Okay, sorry, I had to push the quiz up real quick. Um, I will finish the game and I will put up some extra credit opportunity for the quiz review. So I will get that published for you at, by the end of the session. It's been intensely busy. So sorry, there's a little bit of delay in some parts because I have deadline for curriculum that needs to go in this week so okay good I'm glad everybody's doing okay so we are going to talk about control statement today uh, if you have downloaded the notes and the in-class assignments we're going to go over those things today and then I will add the lab so I just added the quiz um, and then we'll talk about the quiz. So make sure that if you haven't done your assignment for our homework, right, look it over, complete it, so you can take care of the quiz. And then I will add the actual credit assignment as the bonus game for a prize, okay? All right, any question before we start? So this is a fairly easy, unit we're going to cover chapter eight and nine we did some if <coughs> if else statement a couple of weeks ago and also last week we played a little bit with the for loop and the membership operator um, so today what we're going to do is we're going to extend on the content for control statement and then uh, we will create some programs for our assignments. Mainly we're going to write programs so it gives you more practice. So I took some pieces from the text and I added some, some additional points and example and highlights. So if you go through the text, they have some practice example and the chapters are fairly short. Okay. So um, Program flow really is a way that we can uh, specify, sorry, there's a typo there. Specify the order of the program execution. And the, sometimes we would see various conditions that's implemented in our program. And the common condition statement that you would see is the if statement. So uh, we can use an if statement to take an input of the user, compare that to the condition that's set. 
if the condition is met, then the code will, or yeah, the, the program will continue and it will execute the body of that if statement. If it's not true in the case where it's false, then it would go into the next part of the, the uh, statement, which is the else. If we only using the if, right, it's going to test for true. And if it's true, it's going to execute the body of the if. Now, in this case, we don't include an else. So anything that's not true, it's not going to do anything. So therefore, we should include the else. So in the case where it's, if it's false, it's going to go to the else body. The example that we're using here on page one is that we have num variable assigned as three. If num is greater than zero, we would print num is a positive number. And again, we're gonna always print it. Now, if you use num is negative, if we assign num is negative one, if num is greater than zero, print num is positive number, and then print, this is always printed. So in the first case, because we assigned it three, so it's gonna be greater than zero, then it's gonna print, this is positive number, and then it's gonna print again, this is always printed, because there was no additional task that we had asked it to do. So under that if body, it's going to execute this because it met the condition that it is greater than zero. And then to finish out the program, it's going to say this is always printed. And we can replace that with the end or something like that. Um, in the second case where we have num is assigned with a negative one, it did not meet the condition of the test expression here, which is negative one is not greater than zero. So it's gonna skip this one. It's gonna skip num is a positive number. And then it's gonna say this is always printed because that is actually the end of our program. It's not part of the if. So we would use the indentation to indicate that it is the body and then that indentation is followed by the colon. So we want to finish out our control statement with the colon here and then the test expression is next to the if as you can see. So the output I show that's here. So the first part because we assign it three, it's gonna give us positive number. This is always printed. Then for the negative one, it's gonna skip the positive number statement and it's gonna go to, this is always printed. So fairly simple, right? If you see an unindented area, that's not part of that if block where if it's indented in, then we know that is the body of that control statement. Any question regarding the if? Okay, so I will open up idle and I can show you the example. Now, in some cases, we would use if inside another if, and then we'll talk about if else and if elif, right? So in, uh, so in this program, we saw earlier the output of the example here. Now let's take a look at your unit five in class assignment. 
So for number one, it says John is 21 years old. Write a Python to check if John's age is older than 18 years of age. That should be easy. Program should contain if statement, provide screen capture of script and output. So we would create a variable to hold John's age, which is 21. And then we would use it with the if statement to check if it's greater than 18, because we wanted to see if he's older than 18. And then we want to output some kind of text to say that he's older or not, right? So in this, this exercise, I simply use age variable and I assign it 21. And then we would continue the program by using the if statement. And we would say if age is greater than 18, print John is older than 18. Now, if we if we we specify here we assign a value to age as 21 so when it gets to the test expression here it would check that 21 is higher than 18 so it's going to execute john is older than 18. okay so when we run this program since i have multiple local program combined you will see for the example program, it shows this, right, for the first part and then this for the second part. And then for our exercise, it shows John is older than 18. Okay. So we simply give John age 21 here, assign that, and then write an if statement and make sure we use the colon and then we indent for the body. Very easy. Okay. Any question? Okay. So as you complete that very simple program, take a screen capture of your script and your output after you run it it should show that John is older than 18. Okay, any question? So now we would expand it and, and use if else because in, in live we would have different type of condition that would apply for various things from retailing to making a decision Right, so in if else statement, it would evaluate and execute the body when the test condition is true for the if. If the condition is false, then it's gonna go to the else body. And we saw this a couple weeks back when we did the lab, when I introduced it back then. So here again is the format. So you would write if, and then the test expression, whatever you want to put the condition here. Then you want it to do something if that is true. So the body of if, then else, if it's false, then we're gonna do something else here in the body of else. So with this, you see a diagram for it, for the flow. Okay. Now the example that we use here is, we have num is a sign negative five. And we use if num is greater and equal to zero, print positive or zero, else print negative number. So first it's gonna test and see if negative five, which is in num, is greater or equal to zero. Then 
since it did not meet the condition, it's going to skip positive or zero. It's not going to do that print. It's going to go to the else and it's going to execute negative number. So therefore we have negative number output because negative five is not greater and equal to zero. Okay, here's the explanation for that. So we would use if else to really control on how our program will flow, right? In some cases, like we would use it for input validation. If the user enter the number that is greater than this number, then you would, you would have it do something. If they don't input the number that is greater than the specified value or the criteria, the condition, then you would do something else. The program would do something else. So in our assignment, it tells you to, for number two, it tells you to use the if else statement for this. And you can use other loops for this, but since you know it, this is at the beginning, we'll use if else to make it simple. Store A sells 50 inch LCD TV for $400 and charges for shipping. Store B sells the same LCD TV for $530 and provides free shipping. The television weighs 65 pounds and shipping company charges $1.25 per pound to ship the TV. Write a Python program that determines which store charges less for the TV. Program should contain if else statement, provide screen capture of script and output. So there are a few elements that we need to look at when we need to take a look at this problem. First, we have to really look at the price of the TV in store A. So we have to use a variable to create, to store $400 as the price of the TV in store A. The second element that's given you in that first sentence is that store A charges for shipping. So not only that the customer have to pay for the TV, the customer also have to pay for the shipping. So the entire cost for that TV would be TV plus shipping. So we have to be able to calculate the shipping costs for TV in store A. So that means that we would have a variable that holds the price for the TV from store A and something to hold the shipping value or the shipping costs for store A TV. Next, it says that store B sells the same TV for $530. So we would have another variable to hold the price for TV in store B. However, they provide free shipping. So when the customer buys the TV in store B, they don't have to pay additional costs for shipping. Okay. And to calculate the shipping, it tells you that there's a the TV weights 65 pounds and the company charges $1.25 per pound. So we can calculate the shipping by taking the weight and multiply it by the, the cost per pound, the shipping cost per pound. So that would give you the shipping cost for store A. Okay. So this should be a very easy program. I originally had more elements to this program, but when I was going through it and I asked my husband for his opinion and he said, no, it's too complex. You know, it will confuse your students. So I simple, it simplify it just to make, and this is more of like a real case scenario, right? Like for example, if I buy it from a local store or some, some, a smaller store than Amazon or Best Buy, I have to pay for shipping, right? But it could be less than 
in price. And then I can buy from one of the main store where I pay a little bit higher in price, but they cover shipping. It's they ship for free. So for our program, and you can start writing it. It should be very easy to write. Okay, let me open mine up. We just have to implement an if else statement. Okay, so the top part is the example program. So for the second part, the second part, I put store ATV, it's $400. And the TV weight, it is 65 pounds because it's the same weight in both store. It's not gonna be different. It's the same exact television. The shipping, I would have the TV weight multiplied by $1.25 per pound. And you can put that into a variable too if you like, that's fine too if you wanted to keep it clean that way. But I just wanted to put it this way, so that saves me one line. And then I would put print the shipping cost, so I wanna show what that shipping cost is because ultimately that will be added to our TV from store A. And then, so once I print the shipping cost, I would print the store A TV would cost me the TV plus shipping. Okay, so that takes care of the total cost for that TV if I buy it from store A. <clears throat> then store B TV costs $530. So I would put the price for the store B TV. And since you have to pay attention to this because Uh, actually, this would be wrong. So with the store B TV, it will just be the actual TV itself. Okay. And then when we compare, we just need to, we just need to print, we need to compare the total cost. Let me add something else here. I'm gonna change it up a little bit because that way it makes more sense. Sorry, I was completely tired when I wrote this. So. so when we compare, we need to compare the the shipping and the TV itself from, to, from A to just simply the price of the TV from store B. Because when we pay for the TV in store B, we don't have to pay for shipping so we would simply pay for $530. But if we buy the TV from store A, we have to buy the TV plus we have to pay for shipping, okay? So when we compare, we gotta compare the shipping and the TV from A with the store B TV, okay? So if it is, if it is, uh, if A is higher than store A charges TV. So if A is higher, then we wanna say that store A charges more for TV. And then if it's else, then we can say that store B charges more for TV, okay? Okay, so I simply use a variable to hold 
TV price from store A, then I use another variable for the weight. Then I have another variable for shipping, then I calculate weight times cost per pound to give me the shipping cost. Then I print it, that will be my shipping. Then with the store A TV, I have to take the price of the TV plus the shipping to get the, the total price that the customer is gonna pay. Then I print that. Then I use another variable for the store B TV, which is $530. I simply print the price of it to let the customer know. Then we do the comparison with the if statement to check. So if store A total price is higher than store B TV price, then we print store A charges more for TV. Else, we print store B charges more for TV. And you can, you know, print any string that you like. You can say, you know, if A is greater, you can say store B has better deal but I didn't want to do that to confuse everyone. So we simply just say that store A charges more so the customer would know that they would go to store B. Okay, so here we have shipping costs is $81.25. And with the store A TV, it comes out to be uh, $481.25. Okay, and then with the store B TV, it comes out to be roughly, well, it's the same, $530. So B definitely charges more for the TV. Okay, and we can format it to get this one to get the two decimal if you want. You can use the dot format or you can do the round and make it where it's two decimal, however you wanted to do that to show the decimal, but that's the whole point is to use if else statement. Okay. So in the conclusion of this program, we would see that store B charges more for the TV at 530. So we actually save approximately seven, close to $70, 68 and 75 cents maybe, uh, comparison if, if we buy the TV from store A, even when we pay the shipping. Okay, any question? 48.75. I'm sorry? Uh, it's closer to it's forty eight dollars and seventy five cents you save. Uh forty eight um yeah, forty eight seventy five. Mm -hmm. Well that's roughly what you see, right? And and sometimes they would use that money toward overhead costs like storage and you know display and things like that and employees. So when you're looking at brick and mortar store compared to online store right online store might give you a little bit different in price and then they ship it to you for free where you have the brick and mortar right if you order it and they have to ship it from their warehouse they charge you for the shipping or the delivery fee they call it right so that would be that would be a little bit different okay so that gives you a little bit of real world practice on how you can use programming to analyze something like this. And you can go farther than that, right? You can find the differences in saving for the customer and you can display that as well. So your program could be a comparison program for all different stores. Like you've seen a lot of this online where they have like the coupon program or programs that look at all the same item, all the same product in all different stores. So it crawls through and pull the prices and also the charges. And then it does the comparison analysis and it gives it to you. So you can make it into an app some for something like that. And people would use it, right? You see this for cars. I use one for car. I think I used two car or something like that. And 
they looked at all the dealership and then they look at the MSRP price and you know with the interest rate and all of that and then it gives me like the recommendation on which dealer would have a better deal on cars so you can definitely create a program like that with control statements any question okay so that would be an exercise on if else statement now python is a little bit different than cc plus plus and other languages in the case where it use elif instead of spelling out else if right so when you have if else if else then we can shorten the two else if word and make it elif so it would be short for else if it allows us to check for multiple expressions so basically we nest in another if else in this case so if the condition for the if is false then it's going to kick it over to the next part which is the test expression for the second piece here okay so if the test, the first test expression is tested false, it's gonna skip the body of if, and then it's gonna test the second expression here, okay? If that is true, then it's gonna execute the body. If it's not true, if the test, the second expression is false, it's gonna go to the body of else. So, and again, we would use the indentation to indicate that that will be the body of the control statement. So if all the condition are false, then the else body would execute, okay? Now, you would type it a little bit different than typing out else if, right? So we can combine that into elif and make it add the test expression with the colon, okay? So that's a format for elif, elif else. So here's the diagram for the flow for that, okay? So first expression, if it's testing false, it's gonna go to the second test expression. If it tests true, it's gonna execute the body of elif if it tests false, then we're gonna send it to the body else. It's gonna send it to here, okay? But initially, if it tests true under the if, it would execute the body for the if. So there are three components in this particular statement, right? So here's the example. We have num is negative 5.2, and if num is greater than zero, then we would print positive number. L if num is equal to zero, we would print zero. Else, print negative number. And in this program, it's gonna print negative number because num is assigned negative 5.2. It is not greater than zero, so it's gonna skip the print positive. It's not gonna do that. Then it's gonna check, is negative 5.2 equal to zero? Since it did not meet that condition either, it's gonna skip the print zero part. Then next, it's going to go to the else because we have faults from the first part, faults from the second part, so else is executed. Print negative number, and that's our output. Okay? Very straightforward. Any question? Okay. So here, there's some explanation for that. And let's do a program from our assignment.
Now with this one, you can use other loop too, but I require that you use if, else, if, else. So for number three, it says Marcella receives grades on her math assignments, 82, 91, 79, 63, 97. So she got five assignments grade, kind of spread across different grades there, okay? Write a Python program that determines if Marcella's average assignment grade determines if her average assignment grade meets these, these scale, okay? So I should say, this determines Marcella's average grade. So we wanted to see if her average grade is an A, a B, a C, a D, or an F, okay? So now with the range, we have zero, uh, we have 90 to 100, 80 to 89 is a B, and 90 to 100 is an A, 70 to 79 is a C, and a D is 60 to 69, and an F is below 60, okay? So first we have to, number one, add up all her assignment grade and then divide it by five so we can get the average. So first we have to find the average grade for her assignments. Then we would apply the conditions to check and see if, what, if it meets a certain grade criteria. Okay, A, B, C, D, or F, okay? So with this, we can use a list, right? And then we can sum all of that up. You learned about the sum method already. That should be easy. You just pass the list name inside the parameter. Instead of using, you know, a for loop, you can do that. And that would add up all the values then you divide it by five to get the average. From there, you would take that average and you would check that average for each of the grade condition. If average is this, but remember we're working with range, so we have to say, is it gonna meet between 90 to 100? So if Marcella gets an 82, then it's gonna have to, it's gonna fall into the grade B range, okay? So you can use your logical operator, the and, the or, and the not, right, in this case, okay, to check the criteria for your grade. All right, any question? You could use the length instead of yeah. using the five. Yeah, you can do that too. We learn about that length. You can index and with the four, you can use the membership operator. We'll expand on the for loop shortly. As we cut, we are almost done. We have one more thing with the if condition, so. Oh, no, I meant. Was that the right one? Sorry, I got like three hours sleep, so I'm I'm a little bit off today. <laughs> okay, let's see. Okay, yeah, it was. <laughs> okay, so the first part is our example. As you can see, we saw that. So I had created a list called grades and uh, it would hold the given value 82, 91, 79, 63, and 97. So those are the grades that Marcella earned for her assignments. Then I have the total variable to hold sum of grades. So I simply pass that or you can, you know, you can use the loop to, to get it to generate and we'll talk about that. Then the AVG grade is total over five, because we want to take the sum divided by five, we'll get the average grade. Then I have 
print average grade. Okay, so we display that. So here I would have if average grade is less than 100, actually I should say equal, less than and equal to 100, right? Then I would have, and if it's greater and equal to 90, because it could be at 90 or it could be at 100, then the average grade is an A. Okay, so that's one. Then for the ELIF, I put average grade is less than 90 and average grade is greater than and equal to 80, so between 80 to 90. So that would be falling under the B range. So we want to use the less than operator here to represent 89 and lower. And then we want to use the greater than and equal to the 80 here because the range says that for B, it's 80 to 89. So that will be a B. And then we have another elif, average grade is less than 80 and average grade is greater than and equal to 70, that will give us the C grade, okay? And then the last one for the D grade that will be less than 70 and greater than and equal to 60. And all else, right, last condition that we would say that the average grade is an F. If it's under 60, then we would say that that will be an F, okay? Because we already specify the condition here. So <clears throat> we calculated out and we would see that her average grade is 82.4. Right, and we can round it, you can ceiling it, you can floor it, however, but index ZAC since 82.4 falls in this range, I'm sorry, in this range, the second criteria, it executes that it is a B. And so our condition is met in the second ELIF. Okay, any question? So it skipped the A because when we have the average, it's lower than the range, okay? Then it's gonna go to the next ELIF, check that since it met that condition, it's gonna say that it's grade B and then forget the rest because the program already finished there. I had a quick question. Sure. Is there anything like a, a switch case? Switch, switch, I forget how it's, what it's called. <laughs> is there anything like the switch yeah, statement? Yeah, it is in switch case. Uh, there is, but you, you probably better off just writing function or something better because <laughs> that will be simpler, uh, you know, because yeah, it, it, where it gives you the option like the switch in the case, yeah, because it's C-based, so you have something like that. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're looking for efficiency in the options, you can also like create the function, the function with it. Um, Python doesn't really have the expansion like what we see in Java and other languages like that, um, mm -hmm. because they try to simplify a lot of the stuff the processes in Python, so yeah. But we'll come back to that, I, I promise. When we go through and we look at other processes, we'll come back to that, okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, other questions? Now, you can use other loops in this, of course, right? Which simplify like so many we, we would simplify the processes. So it depends on, you know, if you choose to use if, elif, else, then that takes a little bit longer. Okay, so, um, but anyway, 
So this is a good practice. Okay, any question? Yeah, I think a lot of my beginning programming students, they like the if else statement because it's easy to understand than some of the other loops, but this is a harder area because you have to apply logic right on how it checks true false. Um, but if you can use control statement, you can do a lot of things in programming because in all our real world cases, we have to apply control statement in artificial intelligence in you know, everyday decision making in street lights turning red and green and yellow. Right. All of those things are programmable and, you know, and stuff like that. So uh, it's very important that you understand how to apply control in your program. OK. So we should do that in a GIF, right? Very quick. OK, so next one, it shows you the nested if statement. So you can have an if and an if and then the else. Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to do an if, elif, nested like that, right? It won't like it. Um, you can try it, and it's going to try to throw an error. So when you nest the if, you have to state that it's if, if and then else, else, okay? So now we would use the indentation to show the body of each one because if you move the, if you tab it back, that will be indented. If you backspace it and if it aligns, the alignment for the indentation is important. And that's how Python interpreter would see which body belongs to which statement. So that's important to really understand. So in this example program, we have the number num, which is it, num holds integer, and that's parsing from the input when the user type in a value. Okay, enter a number. If it's greater and equal to zero, then it would say if num is zero, it would print zero. So we need to check what they input. If they type in zero, it would print zero. If the user type in other number, it's gonna go to else print positive, right? And then else print negative. So this program can be better by, you know, implementing other conditions. It's not to the best state. But this kind of give you an example of how it would use the if statement nested. So when the user input negative five, it would say that it would be negative number. Okay. So that means that it checks this and that's not true. So it forgets about this and this, and then it's going to jump to the last, the last else. Okay. Because it already checked. If it's greater or equal to zero, it's not. So it's going to skip the zero and the positive. Then it's going to go to the last else. OK. Any question with the nested if? OK, so let's talk about number four. OK, Star Cup sell a cup of coffee for $5. The store provides 10% discount for purchases when all the following conditions are met. The customer has to spend $30 or more uh, on purchases of beverages. Okay. So that means that my total has to be higher than 30. Um, and we need to have six or more beverages in one purchase in one transaction. Okay. 10 or more beverages purchased in the last 30 days. Write a Python program to determine if the customer received discount based on the amount of coffee being purchased. So the program should prompt the user two things. How many cups of coffee they purchased in the last 30 days, right? And we would use the input to check the condition. The second questions that it should prompt the user is, 
how many cups of coffee they want it, they want to buy today in one transaction. So we can check for the second bullet, right? So now if you know they the stores they do this, sometime they will give discount if you buy more things. So if the user put in higher number than six, then we need to check to see if the user would get the discount. Okay, but we want all the conditions met. So we can implement logical operators with this using, you know, just the shortened condense if else, but in the case we want to practice the nested if. So we want to use nested if statement for this program and we would have multiple inputs. So we would have the input for the 30 days in the last 30 days and then the input for how many cups of coffee they want to buy today. Okay. And then we would store that into two separate variable, use those to compare. And then we also, we can use the input for the today purchase and calculate if it's going to be greater than $30. If it is, then we're going to give them 10% discount. Okay. So now, let me go open up my program and show you while you're working on that. Any question regarding Star Cups number four? Okay, so here is the example program that we saw in our notes. That's at the top. Okay, so I put down that the coffee price is $5. That's in the variable because I want to be able to calculate the purchase for today. The previous purchase is int input. How many cups of coffee have you purchased in the last 30 days? I asked them. Or you can use like enter the number of cups of coffee you bought in the last 30 days. However you want to do that, okay? And then the next one is that I want to calculate the, the dollar amount that they're going to spend on coffee today. So I would have coffee purchase is into, uh, I'm sorry, this is the number of coffee they're going to buy. So coffee purchase is int input how many cups of coffee you want to buy today. So that's my second question. And then the purchase amount is coffee purchase times coffee price. Okay. And if the previous purchase is greater than 10, and if the coffee purchase is greater than six, and if the purchase amount is greater and equal to $30, then we would give them a certain amount of discount. So we would take the purchase amount times 10% because we're gonna time the 10% of what they spend today, okay? Then we're gonna show the discount amount. And the second part here is just, I'm formatting that to two, two decimal points. And then after I print out the discount amount, I would print out, right, the total with the discount is that I'm going to take the um, purchase amount and I'm going to subtract the discount because we have to reduce it for them, reduce the 10% the that we gave them as discount. And then on the last else here, if they did not meet any of these conditions, then we would have to say, you need to buy more coffee to receive, I'm sorry, this should be 10%, 10% discount, right? Okay. So let's run this. Sorry, this is the first program. So, okay, so how many cups of coffee have you purchased in the last 30 days? So let's say that I bought 12 cups how many cups of coffee I want to buy today. So let's say I want to buy from my company, so I'm going to buy seven cups. So all together, right, I would get a 10% discount, which gives me $3.50. 
and my total with the discount is $31.51. Okay. So as I test this, that works. Okay. And we can retest it again with the less value. So let me close my shell and so that way, because the font is a little larger, so it's going to flow to the bottom. So let's do an F5. Okay, so in the last 30 days, let's say that I bought uh, seven cups of coffee and today I'm gonna buy another seven. So it tells me, sorry, right? I need to buy more coffee to receive the 10% discount, okay? So here we can put those conditions together with the nested if, and then we can apply it to like a real case scenario for the retailer world, right? And it's pretty easy to see. Okay, any questions? So consider your project that's coming. Actually, yes, question. Actually, yes. So oh never mind. I think I should. I got, so you don't you don't have to put an else for all the ifs, right? All the nested. No, because we want all three of those to be met, and then together, like they could not have any otherwise, right? The ten percent discount is that if they spend thirty dollars and they they have to buy ten or more last month and they have yeah. to buy six or more today. I kind of got confused because the example does have two L's. Yeah, the example, the example they, you would, if you applied the L's there, then you have to repeat the message continuously. And I don't see the point in that, right, Chris? Like if, if I have the L's under each if, it's gonna, we have to yeah. repeat the message like, sorry, or, you know, and, you know, so it's the same message that's being displayed. So there's no point to do that. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so this one is pretty easy. So think about how we would approach our project down the line and, and what type of conditions we need to apply. So, you know, and in the case where if you wanna make a game in, using programming language or like Python or something like that, you will have to apply, you know, a lot of control in your game, right? Like even on the simple case where the user pick, you know, uh, a weapon okay so to choose from a list of weapons select the weapon if the user select this weapon remove it from the list right and then with that right if if that person that that character is buying a weapon then you got to reduce the dollar amount or gold in the pocket or whatever so in in a lot of cases you would see this being applied whether it's game it's real world it's data analysis it's you know it has a lot of functionality so okay so this is exercise four and remember that we can parse we need to parse it right with the input because if you have it just regular input then it just be it's coming in as ascii text so it's not going to be where it's going to throw an error because you, when you try to calculate it uh, it won't be accurate because we want to have it as an integer so that way we can calculate the amount of the amount that they're going to spend on coffee and then we would apply that into the discount
Okay, any questions? Okay, so as you test through exercise four, right, you can gain a little bit of more practice with if nested if. Okay, so last week we already talked about the for loop a little bit. We, I preview it a little bit, and then this week we're going to spend a little bit more time on writing for loops. And it's Compared to, you can write it like the way, you know, with the components with the C, C++, but Python is so much simpler. The fact that we have membership operator, which is fantastic because I think that's so great where we, you can, you don't have to look at like start, stop, and then, you know, but when you implement the while loop, you will have to have a starting point and a cap point which is when you want it to stop. So uh, otherwise it would just go infinitely. So with the four, we can use to iterate over a sequence, right? And we would often see like list, tuple, dictionary, set, or string. So we played with string last week. We touched a little bit on list since, you know, earlier in the semester. Uh, so in any case, when you have a collection of values or objects in a container, you can utilize the loop to have the iteration uh, action that goes from one point to another. Uh, and so we can write a set of statement that would allow us to access each of the item in the container by either, you know, usually indexing. So we would access the values for each of the element in the list, or we can look at tuple, right? We'll talk about tuple next week and list again, uh, or set, etc. So the format is this. So you would do a for a value and then whatever that's in that sequence, right? You would refer to that as an identifier. And then we would use a colon and then indent the body for four. Okay, very straightforward. So here is where the four, so it's gonna have for each of the item in the sequence. So if you have five items, it's gonna go through it five times, right? If you specify that that's the length of your group or your sequence. And then when it gets to, in order to go from one to the next, right, it simply check, is it the last item? If it's not, then it's going to keep going back to the body of the four. Okay, so if it's the first item, right, go to the body, second item, go to the body, and so forth until it gets to the last item, the last element, then once it finished that, it's going to exit the loop. So the for allows us to have repetition. So here is an example. You have a, you know, a list that contains values starting with six, five, and then it goes on. So here we have two, four, six, eight, nine elements. Okay. And what we want to do is we, I call this the running sum where we would take each number and as we go through the loop, we're going to add those value, right? From each of the element, we're going to find the total at the end. So here we would initialize total as zero because it is a container. We want to set up that container to hold the sum of all the numbers in that list. Then here, this vowel here, we talked about this last week, but if you miss it, it's just like a way that we would refer to the item itself or what would be the index like I in the regular C++ for loop. So we would say 
for the value in number, so it could be this one, this one, this one, this one, or this one, or go on forever, right? So we would say for val in numbers, for each of the value in the numbers, right, we would do a total is total plus value. So we would add each one of this as we send it, we, we go through the loop, okay? And then we will print out the sum, which gives us 48, okay? So you can do it that way. Okay, so before we talk about the range, let's do a practice. Let me get my battery plug, otherwise it's going to go to sleep on me. Okay, so uh, Let me close some of the program real quick so I can. Okay, here. Um, for the next one, it tells you that in the diet plan, a client loses 10 pounds the first month, 12 pounds the second month, 8 pounds the third month, and 4 pounds the fourth month. Write a Python program that uses the for loop to find the total weight that the client had lost over four months. Provide the screen capture of the script and output. So that's pretty easy. You can set it up in a list where it would start with 10 and it goes to 12, eight, or and five, or you can have it with the variable, right? But if we do a list, we would be able to implement the for loop. And so that way we can do a running sum, like the example, to add up our weight loss for the client, okay? And we're only gonna do it, this is the four months weight loss program. So, let's open up the, let me open up the for loop program that I had. Okay. So at the top, that was the example program that you see in the notes, right? So here's exercise five. So here's weight loss. I have a weight loss list and I initialize it at 10, 12, eight, and five. And following the example, you can follow the example there. So, um, I have a total L for total loss is zero. You can name it whatever variable you want. And I would say for I in weight loss, total L plus equal I, right? We have a running sum. So I use a compound assignment operator there where technically that is total L is equal to total L plus I. That's that's what it's what it is and then I would do a print weight loss in four months is total L right okay so that would be using the for loop and we simply add up this we use the membership operator in because we're saying for each of the element in that list, weight loss, we would add them together and put it in total L. So it's gonna loop four times, right? And it's gonna tell me the total, okay? So it's going to print here. Now, if you indent the print, what will happen is it's just going to repeat the print as it loops because it thinks that it's part of the body of the four. So if you, if you take away the indentation, if you unindent it, it's going to go 
to the edge there, right? Then that means it's not a part of the for loop. So it doesn't reprint every time. Okay. Any question? So that would be the weight loss program. Now I'll talk about the range shortly, but let me run this so you can see and the, the range one's gonna run with it too. So for that program, I would have the total weight loss of the four months is 35. Okay, so that client lost 35 pounds in four months. Okay. Okay, any question regarding for loop? Just a few lines for that one. Okay, uh, next we're going to talk about a range what happened to my let me close this i'll come back to that okay So range function can be used with the for loop. It, think of like how C++, it has the for range. Um, and what we can do is we can implement the, the returns of the sequence of numbers using the range. So by default, you can have it go from zero. Remember that it's always gonna start with the range is from zero. So it's a function that's going to allow it to automate from zero to whatever number. And by default, it's going to increment one by one. But you can have it skip in that range by doing this step. Okay, so you can have a point where it would start, where it would stop, and how it would skip through or step through. Okay. So the option is the start, the optional and the step, but the requirement is the stop. So if you don't put the step, it's just gonna default to one that's gonna step to each one of the element or the item in that group. And if you don't put the start, it's just gonna assume that the, the default is gonna be zero. So it's always gonna start at a zero, but you can have it range right in the middle of your set or your list where we would start at let's say five and we would go to a hundred instead of starting at zero okay so range allows you to really sequence through the container at a certain value and the default will be zero and it's going to step through one by default so here we would have a uh, val is range three six and it says for n in val print n okay so what we have is we would have a start a stop and we would have it as a for loop and here just indicate the value inside that range okay in this range so it's going to hold each one and it's going to print okay so it's going to print three okay because it start at three and then it's gonna go go through. So when you do that, you have an output of three. Okay. And I'm sorry, three, four, five. So three, four, five, it stops at six because six is the placement for the end. Now with the range, we can use a way that we can have it automated in our program. So let me show you how I really wrote the weight loss one. 
So with the using range, I have for val in range, and here I would put the length, which is the number of the, you know, right? The, the, the size of that list. So we want to go to the size of that list, and then that would be, and inside of that parameter of length, I have to put weight loss, which is the list name. Okay. So simply, I have a stopping, a stopping point, which is, you know, to the end of the form, the for there. Okay. So that's required. And then what I do is I print weight loss a month. So what I'm doing here in this loop is that I'm going to print weight loss month one, two, three, and four, right? So I have a val plus one here. And then I, I specify each of the value from that list. So it would say weight loss month one is 10, weight loss month two is 12, and so forth. So when it's looping through each one, it's going to tell me each of the value, okay, from that list. And then it's going to calculate the total. And I simply do a print, right, for the sum of my list. And yes, I can do a running sum with that too. But I want to show you the differences, and you're still going to get the same. So when we when we run this, right, the second part of this is using range is this right here, okay? So it tells me weight loss month one is 10 pounds, month two is 12 pounds, month three is eight pounds, month five is, I mean, month four is five pounds, and all together we have 35 pounds lost. So it's just a different approach in how to implement the range function in the for loop compared to the last one where we simply just have a for loop and we use the index to access element value from that list and then we have a running sum. I might be speaking for myself. Yeah. But um I got at first I got confused of why you're showing different value using the word value and it's coming but I I remember that this one is uh, the index because it's the square back it's yeah just make sure it, just make sure it's always yeah. it's always going to be index right so when you can name it anything you want so here I can change it to like j cuz I know a lot of like C++ people that like to use I and J, right? And then you just have to pass it with the right. It's an identifier, you can name it. And sometimes people will say it count, right? So that way it counts up. Uh, but yeah, however you wanna name it. So, but really you are looking at the index in that range to access the value in that list in each loop. Okay. okay, so yes, it is going to each of the index here starting at zero because the range, the range is going to default to the zero and it's going to go to the length of that list, which is the last one here, which is index three or the fourth element, okay? So when we, and we are required to have a stop, we don't have to have a start. So if you don't have a start, it defaults to index zero, which has 10 pounds, okay? So it would start there and it's gonna go to the next one, the next one, and then it's gonna finish at five, which is index three. And that completes the length of that list. Okay.
So a way that we can get away from not using length is to specify the range from zero to the end, right? But we can simply use the length by not have not having to specify too many L, uh, components in the parameter, include too many parameters there. So just a different technique. Any question? And I put J plus one here because we human count starting at one, the computer counts starting at zero, right? Because if you say month one, month two, month three, month four, you don't say month zero. So we have to do a plus one there to make the human understand that, that that's the first, 10 is the first, right? We don't say the zeroth. We say the first, so we have to do a plus one, okay? Any question? Okay, so two approaches there. All right, next. We're gonna finish a little early today, I'm sure. Just got a couple things to go over and Okay. Uh, next is we're going to talk about while loop. So with the while loop, um, the expression is check first and the body of the loop entered only if it evaluates true and it's going to keep going as long as it is true. It would exit when it evaluates false. So if you, you have with the while, we want for it to finish at some point, right? Otherwise it goes infinitely, unless there's certain things that you want it to keep going forever. Like, for example, you have a coin exchange machine that's always gonna, uh, always gonna accept customer deposit of coins one after another. So, at the end of the each of the transaction it's going to loop back to the beginning where it would have a start menu and the the customer would pick deposit coin again so in this case where you want that thing to keep running forever then you would think about maybe consider a loop that will bring it up every single time um so here it talks about the evaluation in the test expression, it shows you the diagram. So it's gonna have the test expression check and if it's true, it's gonna execute the body and it's gonna keep doing so as long as it is true. But when the test expression evaluates false, then it's gonna exit the loop, okay? As we just talked about. So here, what we would have is we would have it go, and you can use a while similarly to the for loop where we would have a starting point and an ending point where we would have that range to be, to be looped through, okay? So here we would have your input is eight. So this is the number, this value here, n is eight. And you would have the total variable would be the variable that holds the running sum as you add each of the value. And you would start with one. So we want to be that while i is less than and equal to n, that means it's gonna go from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So it's gonna check that if one through eight, as long as the value for i is less than and equal to n, we're gonna add it up. So it's gonna add one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And when we do do that, we're gonna go ahead and update the counter for i every time, okay? 
So we wanted to do, to have an increment. And you see this with, with you know, how we would implement it in the for loop where we do an I plus plus. So we would just do an I plus one in this case. And so now we would go ahead and print the sum and the total is, right? And it would run it through and it would add it up, okay? Any question? Okay, so that's how you would use the while. Um, so for number six, it says, given the range of number zero through 100, write a Python program using range to print all even values from zero. And that's easy, that just went back to what we were talking about. So you can have a start with inside the range function, which is zero, and then you have a stop, which is 100, and then you have a step, which is two, because you want only even values. So it's gonna go zero, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, blah, 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 right? All the way through. So you would have, you would have a range from zero, through 100 with only even, okay? And I have a program that's created for that, so I'll show you real quick. So we're gonna go ahead and open. So this is the example, and then I have another example Okay, where we would have, it stops at five, right, for C and vowels, print C plus one. So we, we would have it go from one through the end, which is five. Now for our exercise, we simply do three lines. We have num, range is zero through 100, step two. For i in num, print i. So it's going to print 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, all the way through 100, skipping 1 every. So we would have all even. Okay, so when we run this, as you can see, So the f example one, you have three, four, five, that was there. And then example two, since we go from one, right, C in vowels, print C plus one. So we would have one through five there. So that's example two. And then my exercise six start here, zero. So all the even number, okay. So it starts right here and it prints all the even number. Is there a reason why it doesn't print a hundred? It's number. Oh, 100. because 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 it's the number one hundred. Yeah. So if you want that, you have to move one up. Okay. And is there yes. any way to indent the numbers, like a like tab, instead of having it indent to a new line? Uh, like in like you want it all in display in one line then you have to fuse format to not, because it auto carriage, it does the, the, the next line for every single one of them. That's the way they built it to have it displayed for print. So with that, you have to do another format method inside the print for I. Okay. Yeah, it's, you know, so take a little bit of work. If you want it like in columns or one of whatever, yeah, then you have to format it to, with the print method. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so good question. So if you look, it stops at 98 as we put the marker on the 100. So if you want more than you want to include the 100, then you have to have the one up, the one placement up, which is put the marker behind 100, okay? All right. Any question? 
That's number six. For number seven, it says, at a restaurant, Katie orders the following item. She got a burger, which is $9.99, a milkshake, $5.25, fries, you know, so the given prices, fries, two tacos, nachos, and lemonade. Write the Python program that determines the subtotal of Katie's order. Program should use while loop, provide screen capture of script and output. So what we can do is since we are practicing the while loop, we can have this using it put into a list so we can index it. And then we would give it a starting point, right? And then we would have to, to go up to the end of that list or if you specify the length or if you can use the, the uh, number of your elements that you have which is in this case six items that she's ordering okay and so we just have to total it up as it's accessing each okay so no i click that Okay, so exercise seven, start in the middle there. The first part is just the example. So I have a list called foods and I put in the price for each of the item of her order, right? And you know, the if you want it a little bit more interactive, then you can ask the user to pick and then take the input and interpret that into a price, right? So you know, if it's more of like a kiosk when they press that button and then it's gonna add the 9.99. So really it's drawing from a list. Um, and I initialized the subtotal there. The reason why I call it subtotal is because we're not including tax or anything else with the tip, et cetera, okay? And we would start at zero because that would be the first element here and we would say that while j is less than length of foods okay because we want to go up to the end uh then we would have subtotal is subtotal plus food with the index so what we have is we're going to do a running sum we're going to add this guy up with this one with this one with this one this one and all the way to the end okay and then um, then we would have j is equal to j plus one because we want to count up every single time, right? One, two, three, four, five, after zero. Um, and then we would print our subtotal amount. And I simply, at this point when I did this, I was a little tired. So I just simply use a round method with, inside the print and I wanted to round it to two decimal points, which is more valid, right? Because if I have any straggling decimal points afterward, I want to round it up to the cents. So I would have the subtotal with the round two, okay? So when we run this, let me exit this so it would put it at the top. So the example we have, uh, is 36, but our subtotal is going to come out to be 29.98. Okay, for her food order before tax and tips. Okay, any question? So that's how we would implement a while loop. Right, in the case scenario where we would add up all the elements in the list. And of course you can use the for loop as well. Okay.
So as you complete seven, uh, after you write the, the while loop, right, use and add all the items that Katie ordered. Take a screen capture for me. And then eight and nine, we're gonna use continue and break. So in Python program, what we can do is we can have range to generate the numbers as we've been doing in the last couple of exercises. What we can do is we can also break, right? At a, we can have it stop at a certain point so that way it doesn't go to the next one. Okay, or we can continue it in a different spot by using the continue statement, very similar to Java and C++. So same concept there, okay? So in the break statement, it terminates the loop and resume the execution in the next statement. So that means that it would just stop it there and then if the program has other parts, it's gonna to go to the next part of the program after that loop. The break terminates the loop containing it. The control program flows into the statement immediately after the body. So it gets out of the, the loop and then it goes to the next statement. Um, so we would want the break if there's some kind of changes in the condition okay and so this is the diagram for that if it's yes if it checks true for break then it exit the loop if not it's just going to keep going for the body so here if we print if we have a for loop and here we're using val again but that's really an index right so if val in programming string or for val in programming string and if val is i if it gets to a character i it's gonna break so in this program we're gonna index to each of the character in the string programming and in the condition where it is an i then it's gonna stop okay we want it to stop when it's an, uh, an i Okay, so we're gonna have it break, and for each one we wanna print. And as it gets out, it's gonna say the end, right, finish, no more, okay? So our program is gonna do P-R-O-G-R-A-M-M, -G -G -O -O -M -M, and it's gonna stop because it sees the I, and then it's gonna show the end, okay? Any question? Now, with the continue statement, what you have is you would have, it would return the control to the beginning of the while loop, okay? So I would, if, if I use the continue in certain spot, what it would do is, in some cases, it would skip that, that character if it's like a string in the index, uh, an index in the string, and then it's gonna come back to the while loop and it's gonna pick up on the next, it's gonna loop to the next character after that. So the continue statement can be used to skip some part of the code inside the loop with the current iteration only, okay? It doesn't terminate, but continues on the next iteration, and that's important to know, okay? Because in the break, it terminates where this one, it continues on the next iteration, therefore it skips. So if we're using the same example again, what we'll do is we have the for loop for the string to access the, the index of each of the character and display each of the character. And inside the for loop, we nested the if, and we would say if val is i, continue print val. 
So what that will do is when it gets to the I, it's not going to print that I, right? It's going to come back to the beginning of the while loop, and it's going to pick back up, and it's going to do NG to finish that out, okay? So the I won't be displayed using continue. And then at the end, it's going to print the end. So for our program, what we have is So I'll show you the break one first. Okay, so for number eight, we have the break. This is the example, right? So I have nums and I would have a range 20. So if I don't put the start, which is zero, right? It's just gonna default to it anyway. So I can just simply put 20 because the assignment tells us to go from zero to 20. And then I have a for loop for C in nums if C is 11 break. Print num C. Okay. Any question? So when we run this, okay. So here is the break. So this is the example. And for the exercise eight, I have zero and it got through 10. When it gets to 11, it's gonna stop. Now, if I wanna include 11, then I have to specify that C is 12. So it's gonna go from zero to the 11, but this one, it says to the 11th number, right? Which is not 11, it's actually 10. So if you count from zero to 10, that gives you 11 places. So it did print zero through 10, and then it stops, it exit the loop. Okay. Any question? So that's one's very easy. Okay, we have for loop, if nested, break, print. Okay. Now for the continue. So for the continue, here's the example program at the top. But for the continue, I go for the range start at zero. So we default zero, we don't need to have a start. So I just put range 25, that will be my nums. And then I have for V in nums, if V is 20, continue, print V. Okay, so the top one is the example here where it skips the I, mm -hmm. and then my shell gives me from zero all the way down to all the way down to 25, but you notice there's no 20. It skips the 20 and then it picks back up at 21 and it finishes that out through 24. Okay, any question? Okay, so we got a little bit of practice with break, continue, range, for loop, while, if, L if, if else, right?
Okay, if you finished, submit your work. And I will stop sharing. If you want to add your name, you can. But I will pull the attendance list. Yeah, no problem. I don't mind. Sorry, Andrea. I looked at the chat all late. <laughs> Any question? Anything that you missed that you need me to touch on? Okay. Okay. All right. If you're using a nickname, you can type in your name in the chat so I know who you are when I pull the chat, the chat log. But, um, well, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. And then, uh, so there will be an extra credit thing that's going to go up. I just didn't have time to put in the game code, but I will add that as soon as, you know, uh, thank you. And then I will add that in, in the Canvas, so look out for that. You, you should have a week for the quiz, and then you should have a week for the extra credit, and you can win an e-gift card with that too, okay? All right, any other questions? Don't forget the quiz, and if you didn't turn in the homework, work on that and turn it in, and other assignments if you need to. Okay, have a good afternoon. I'll see you here on Wednesday to do more lab. Okay, take care. Cynthia, did you have any question for me? Yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't make it today, Professor. Um, I, just had some little I know it's okay. It's okay, no problem. What's up? I just uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, so you you were kind of cutting off there, but did you not, were you, are you not clear on certain things? What do you need a clarification on? Okay. What part do you have questions on? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just bringing up my assignment. Okay. Um, I guess if I were to do this, I know that um, maybe I'm just overthinking again, but for example, uh, a split is a form of string method, or is it? just the name of the variable or? A split is another method. So yeah, so it is, it, it works with string. So think of a split is, it's not a name of a variable, but it's a way that we can take that string and make it into a different format when we display it, okay? So think of it like another task. Right, where you, where you when you do a print, it's a task. It shows the whole entire string. But in a split, what we can do is we can have it divided or um, we would use index or string slicing, that's what we call it, to make it into smaller or, or parts of it not showing. Okay. I think 
what I'm going to do is, um, could I just redo my, uh, my timer? Because I'm not finished reading it, uh, I'm just reviewing them. But you can show it to me right now, the stuff that you're not clear, because I enable screen share for you. If you want to screen share, I can take a look at it, or... If you want to highlight, like if you email it to me and you highlight like this section, this question, this question, can you clarify this? And what I'll do is I, I will put in the notes for you, right? Like to look at, you know, what it is and things like that. So that's what I can do for you. Um, if you have like, you know, what's up? I yeah. Know. Yeah. Before you submit it, that's fine. So you can shoot me the attachment and then on the attach on the document itself, you can highlight or put the notes in in a different font color so I can see it. Like, you know, what you are not clear on or you know, you don't understand this. So that way, you know, I can maybe put the notes in or when we see each other again on Wednesday, I can possibly point it out to you at the end that you know so i'll email it back to you okay Great. thank you Dr. you're welcome i'm sorry that you feel a little lost there but hey we can catch you up with no time a lot of this stuff is really simple once you have something clear up it's gonna help okay i just feel a lot more comfortable to speak to you too <laughs> okay yeah that's not a i know i know sometimes it's really hard to really convey all of this remotely because it's you know but yeah send me the e the, the file and i'll take a look at what you're stuck on okay but make notes of it okay thank you you're welcome have a good afternoon okay bye-bye